morning, everybody. As you're coming in to worship, you'll notice that the announcements are now scrolling before you, and I would draw your attention to them. Draw your attention to this announcement slide introducing the deacons. Uh, shortly, you'll uh, see them all. Kathy will make those introductions for people who are joining a little bit after this slide, but these are their names and these are their faces, and we are grateful for their ministry. Good morning and welcome to worship everybody. I welcome you if you are joining live and interactively on Zoom with us right now, you are welcome to worship. And also if you're joining us later by watching the YouTube uh, link, um, we welcome you to worship as well. Lots of different ways that you can participate in the worship life of our church. There are several people working behind the scenes uh, leading us in our worship this morning. I want to acknowledge them at this time. I'm grateful for Brian Myers and Kevin Burchett who are welcoming you in from the waiting room. I'm grateful to George Reisner who is running the slideshow and leading our worship leaders in worship. I'm also grateful to Pat Schmidt and Andy King who are reading our scripture this morning as lay leaders. And if you are interested and willing to read scripture in the future in one of our worship services, there is an online signup uh, that you can see in the newsletter and we'd welcome your voice. Mary Beth Reisner, thank you for lifting up the prayers of the people later in our worship service. Those of you who are chatting those prayers, those prayer requests, Mary Beth Reisner will uh, uh, give them voice. You also are able and invited to use your own voices to share the prayers that you bring in your hearts this morning. Thank you to Francisco Fernandez for bringing us our music and for uh, Stephanie Yas for uh, leading us in our songs. I invite you to remain muted unless you have something that you uh, want to share. And there are a few times in the worship service where you'll be invited to do that and you uh, will be able to unmute at that time. I uh, also invite you to mute yourselves again right after sharing so that background noise is limited and other people can be heard as they share. Again, you are um, welcome to view the worship service in different ways. Uh, gallery view allows you to see multiple faces at once. Uh, speaker view brings uh, just one voice and one face forward on your screen for you. So you are invited to try different things during the worship service uh, as we worship together. You are also invited to use the chat to uh, chat your prayer requests later in the worship service. So if you don't know where that is, you might find that now and and think about uh, uh, when we get to that point in the worship service, you'll have that opportunity to do that as well. 
At this time, I invite you to find a candle if you'd like to participate in the lighting of our Christ candles to start our worship service together. So a candle and something to light it with. And I invite you to join me in prayer. Jesus Christ, light of the world. Shine on us this day, shine through our windows, shine into our hearts, shine into all of the darkened places and shadows of our hearts. Shine in our worship spaces and in our church gathered together. Shine, we pray, upon our communities, our neighborhoods, our schools, our streets. Shine on us, we pray. Shine on your world, we pray. Amen. This morning's prelude is an African-American spiritual, and as is the case with so many of them, its authorship is unknown. These songs rose up from the hot, sun-soaked fields, giving hope and connecting enslaved communities to a transcendent story. In the words of Frederick Douglass, every tone was a testimony against slavery and a prayer to God for deliverance, for peace like a river, for love like an ocean, for joy like a fountain, for faith like a mountain in my soul. Thank you, Francisco. I invite you to pray with me with these words from Jan Richardson. When I have become so reliant on myself that I cannot see the need that gnaws so deep in my soul, open my eyes, open my heart, open my mouth to cry out, for the help that you do not ration, the deliverance that you delight to offer in glad and generous measure. Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem when he told today's story. Large crowds were traveling with him. 
The Gospel writer Luke says, all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told three stories, one about a lost sheep, one about a lost coin, and this one about a father who had two sons. As we listen to Andy and Pat read this story, may Jan Richardson's words echo in our hearts, the need that gnaws so deep, the help you do not ration, the deliverance you delight to offer in glad, in generous measure. This morning's scripture is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15 verses 11 through 32. Then Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare, but here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father and I will say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. <clears throat> but the father said to his slaves, quickly bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and get the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, listen, for all these years, I have been working like a slave for you and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours comes back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed a fatted cat for him. And the father said to him, son, you are always with me and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. In Psalm 51, King David had similar words. Against you, you alone have I sinned so that you are justified in your sentence. In 2009, Presbyterian pastor David Gambrell wrote this version of the text of Psalm 51 and set it to music. 
So I invite us now in this time of confession to sing along or silently read the words as we listen to the music. assurance of God's love is an excerpt from a brief statement of faith, which is a confession written by the members of the newly formed PC Presbyterian Church USA in 1983 to celebrate the reunion of the northern and southern churches divided since the Civil War. These two siblings had been separated over 200 years from 1861 to 1983 and together they wrote this statement. We trust in God, whom Jesus called Abba, Father. In everlasting love, the God of Abraham and Sarah chose a covenant people to bless all families of the earth. Hearing their cry, God delivered the children of Israel from the house of bondage. Loving us still, God makes us heirs with Christ of the covenant, like a mother who will not forsake her nursing child, like a father who runs to welcome the prodigal home. God is faithful still. The peace of Christ be with you, and I invite you to unmute yourselves and offer the peace of Christ to one another. Peace, everyone. Peace, everybody. Peace, everyone. Peace, everyone. Peace, everyone. Peace, everyone. Peace, 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 Hello, Hello. Hi. Hi, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Peace, Kathy. Bless you, sir. Hey, Gary. Good morning, Finn. Good morning, Lane. 
Hey, Meg. I, I really, um, I kind of love seeing you all where you're calling in from, seeing right. you all in your homes or in your cars or in your garden spaces or wherever you're calling in from. It's kind of, it's kind of lovely to see you all. Peace be with you. At this time, we come together uh, sharing the joys and concerns on our hearts and asking for prayers from one another. So I would open up the opportunity to unmute yourself and share a joy or a concern that you bring today. Or if you would prefer, you're welcome to chat it, to drop it into the chat box and Mary Beth Reasoner will give it voice. I have a joy. Louise Solomon, uh, I want you all to know that my son Brian went through surgery very well. The surgeon thinks uh, that everything he sent to pathology, he wasn't suspicious of anything. So we're just now waiting for a pathology report, but it looks good. So thank you, thank you, thank you for all the prayers. Thanks be to God, Louise. I have, I'd like to share joy. Um, I'm Kathy Winter. And you saw the pictures of the uh, deacons and uh, that for this, this term, and it is my great joy to and privilege to serve as the moderator for this wonderful team of deacons. And I'd like to introduce you to them. Um, and deacons, if you would wave if, when I mention your name, that would be great. And I'm going alphabetically backwards. Um, Marge Ward. Hi. Jan Salisbury. Hi. Ryan Myers. Hi, everybody. Katie Meyer. Katie. <laughs> and Luann Belfi. Um, the, <clears throat> I wanted to, the, the ministry, the book of, the Presbyterian Book of Order states that the ministry of deacons is set forth, as set forth in scripture, is one of compassion, witness, and service, sharing in the redeeming love of Jesus Christ. And due to the pandemic, there's a lot that we haven't been able to do as, as, as the deacons have done in the past. Um, we're still managing the Mercy Fund, and we still have monthly um, monthly uh, collections to help the greater community. But we thought it would be really great to be able to reach out to the uh, the community of our church um, by we have we've devi devised a list of a prayer, I mean a, a care group. And it consists of most all the people who we, we see on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, and some that we don't. Um, each deacon has, has 10 to 13 people that we will be reaching out to over the next few days and, and, and weeks and months. And uh, you will feel, you should feel free to contact us if you need anything, um, even if it's just, just a kind word, but anyway, you should be expecting phone calls and or cards soon. And again, I just want to thank the wonderful group of deacons. It's, it's a, we're, we're doing good work, I think. <laughs> thank you, Kathy. It is a joy to be working with you. I have a prayer request for Jeannie Bauman. She is uh, scheduled to have knee surgery yet again, third time actually on this knee um, tomorrow. So we keep Jeannie in prayer and David, her husband in prayer. Also lifting up prayer, uh, prayers for Anne Marie Montgomery, who is my colleague and pastor of the Adrian and Cadmus churches. Uh, she went in last night into the hospital in Toledo for heart concerns and Deborah Davies has stepped in um, to preach at the Adrian church, but we are praying for Anne Marie, for her husband, David. We're praying for Deborah this morning at short notice, preaching uh, at the church in Adrian praying for the churches of Adrian and Cadmus at this time. I have a joy that I finally have gotten my vaccine, which was administered yesterday by an angel. So we're good to go. Chris? I'm Marge Reading Ward. from the 
Go ahead, March. Um, I just wanted to ask for prayers for a cousin of mine who um, both his kidneys are failing and it looks like he might have a disease called um, chain light disorder. Um, and I believe that in, is a form of cancer and it looks bad. He won't be, if it, if it is, they won't be able to do the transplant relief, replant. So please pray for Mark Fierce. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. I, I had two prayer requests myself. Um, a friend's wife had successful breast cancer uh, this week, and her cancer was detected early through her annual mammograms. So ladies, those mammograms, because they were able to catch it early and uh, the surgery was successful. Prayers for her as she begins her radiation treatments and for her wonderful husband as he continues to provide loving support. Also, a young friend of mine has experienced a miscarriage this week. And so I ask for prayers as she and her husband mourn the loss of their baby. Thank you. And Dudley says prayers for the Dickinson family. Don passed away on Friday. Many may know him from the H and R block in Tecumseh. Yeah. And mm -hmm. Doug Bird shares that he and Rochelle have a joy that their daughter Kim is moving back to Tecumseh and arriving this evening. What a homecoming that will be. And Christine notes uh, prayers of joy for her brother Ryan Turner, who closed on his first home this week. Nothing like that first home. <laughs> and Andrew notes that, oh, Lane has a <laughs> praise for the nice weather so that they can go fishing and frog catching again. I have a joy and a, a blessing just thanking everyone for their contributions to the Lenten devotional, which every day has been so meaningful um, as I read them. And uh, has, I just, it's been a blessing. Thank you for all the contributors. This is Carol Liu and uh, I, you're you're muted, yourself, Carol. Uh, this is Carol Lou, and uh, I have a joy, first of all, for the deacons. There's been so much support and love from that group, and you can say you're not doing much this year because of the COVID, but believe me, you're doing a tremendous amount, and I'm grateful for that, and uh, I praise the Lord for that. I also am asking for continued prayers for my friend, Jim Voss. He grew up in Tecumseh, uh, lived there for years and years, and he is now with his daughter out in uh, West Virginia, and he is in care for hospice and with congestive heart failure. And uh, last time I talked to him, not doing very well. So I thank you for the prayers for him also. Hi, this is Carol McConnell. I would just ask for prayers. Sorry. It's okay, Carol. We love you. I just asked for prayers for my brother, Chuck Gerke. Um, lots of things happening for Chuck and um, he needs good thoughts. He needs good prayers. He needs lifting up. He's home, but he has fallen any number of times and some taken some terrific blows to his head. John had him into emergency last night and um, anyway, he's back home. But um, lots of adjustments in that family. And I just ask for prayers for Chuck and for his wife, Cheryl. I know that it's 
really difficult for Cheryl as it is for all of us, but we just hope that somehow we all get through this. Thanks. God, we lift to you those prayers that have been spoken, those prayers that have been chatted, those prayers that have gone unspoken but weigh heavily on our hearts or weigh lightly on our hearts as joys. We lift them all to you. We know that you hear them all, that you feel them all, that you know what resides deep in the recesses of our hearts and you are with us, holding us. So many lifted prayer concerns this morning that were about starting over our theme for today, starting over in a new house, starting over in a new state, starting over with a new normal. And so we pray for strength. We pray for your care, your support, your love, and for the love of the family of faith reaching out to surround each one with additional grace. Be our hands and our feet and our heart, we pray as we lift up to you our joys and our concerns. Amen. As we come into a time with children, we're gonna try something. I think we might try something technically this morning that is new. Um, we're gonna ask everybody who does not have little people in their, uh, in, their, um, in their worship space to mute your camera just for this time so that what comes front, it's like when we invite the children to come down to the front of the church, what comes to the front will be just those families that have children with them. Let's try this and see how this works. Uh, just uh, mute your camera just for this time so that we can have the children uh, down in the front with me, if you would. Let's try this. You can find your camera symbol in the bottom corner of your screen, your device. If you can't find it, don't worry about it. We're just trying something new. As I, as I was growing up, I remember that my grandmother, I called her Nanny. She was, both my grandmothers, I called Nanny. My grandmother, Titus, Nanny Titus, she had a big piggy bank, a really big piggy bank, and she kept it on the floor in her family room. And she would put coins in it. And so when I would go visit her, I would shake it and I would hear the coins in her piggy bank. My grandmother grew up very, very poor and she learned very, very young, maybe even the age of some of you little ones, she learned very young the importance of saving pennies. And so she kept that with her all the way through her life, saving pennies. Do you have a piggy bank? Raise your hand if you have a piggy bank. I see you, uh, Lane, you have a piggy bank? Two. You have two piggy banks? Are you saving for something special? Yeah, I, I, just, I just find like pennies and dollars all over the floor and I look for them. I just pick them up and put them in there. And yeah, also I for saving that with my... for a Disney fun. Wait. Yeah, I, I used to do that with my piggy banks. I love the sound of shaking them and then pouring out the pennies, no. putting them back in again. No. Yeah. We can do with our piggy no. bank. Yeah, that I is really fun. fun. Anybody else have a piggy bank? You're saving for something special? Yeah. Well, I guess just want what? more lane. Go ahead. What? I just want more lane. More lane. More lane. More lane. <laughs> Anna, is Jana around? Does she have a piggy bank? No, we don't want. She does. Yeah. I remember sometimes I would save money to go up to the uh, to the candy store and get some candy. And sometimes um, I would save money for a vacation we were going to go on and I was going to do something fun. Well, we all have these banks right now in this time, these banks, these fish banks, you guys have your fish banks. And even if you're not a little child, you're a child at heart, you have your fish bank. It's the one great hour of sharing season. If you don't have one of these yet, anybody on the call, old and young, young and old, children of all ages, these are outside the church on the bench. And we have extended when we're gonna dedicate these. We're gonna dedicate these banks on the 18th of April when we come back together. So in worship, we will dedicate these banks and all the other offerings for one great hour of sharing. I'm about to show you guys a movie, a short, short movie uh, that talks about three different 
communities of people that we are helping when we put money in here. I asked if you were saving for something special. We in these banks are saving for special people and special communities to help them with our pennies, our nickels, our dimes, our, our quarters, our half dollars, even our dollar coins. And so when we watch this movie together and we think about this idea of starting over, starting over, I want to highlight three stories you're gonna see in the movie or three, uh, three different communities. The first one, you can see her in the top corner of this screen. She's wearing a purple shirt and her name is uh, Trinity White Plume. She is a member of the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota. And she is a young girl who is a leader in her community. Uh, she is um, teaching her community along with other people that are about her age, maybe younger, um, maybe even as young as you are, Lane, learning to grow food off of the land because guess what? Their reservation is about the size of Connecticut and they have one grocery store, one grocery store. So they have, they're very poor community and they have been hit very hard in these times. So Trinity, uh, White Plume, we, when we put our coins in our fish banks, we are saving to help her and her community. The second story is a story in Bolivia. And this is about a community in Bolivia who um, has been hit very hard because there hasn't been very much rain. So uh, they, have, um, they ha don't have good water. They've also had polluted water from some local mining companies in their community. So they depend on healthy, safe drinking water. And when you put quarters and nickels and dimes into your fish bank, you're also helping this community in Bolivia uh, as they are um, able to then get rainwater barrels, plastic rainwater barrels to save the water that comes out of the sky. And they're also building new, um, new water systems there. And the last one, which is the middle picture on your slide that you're seeing now is a community called um, uh, Black Women's Blueprint. And this is in Brooklyn, New York. And these are women who are survivors and they are um, so they have started over some of them many times. The one who founded this organization, her name is Mama O. Mama O is 65 years old and started over many, many times in her life. And because of that, she started this organization. So when we put our nickels and our pennies and our dimes and our quarters into our fish banks, we are also helping Mama O and the women of uh, Black Women's Blueprint. So I'm going to stop talking so we can watch this movie together. And remember, we are helping people by every coin we put into our banks for one great hour of sharing. Together, life during COVID has been challenging. That feels like an understatement, right? At times, we've all felt disconnected, confined, missing family, missing our friends, lonely, worried about if the groceries are going to hold out, and unsure of what the future may hold. Imagine feeling all of those things, but living in a place or in a situation that was already challenging each and every day without the added pressure of a pandemic. A place where access to food is day to day, access to vital health care is questionable. Finding clean water is a daily struggle. A place where you're denied racial justice or plagued with outright violence and oppression. But one thing remains steadfast and true. We are the church together, no matter where we are, and the church belongs with those struggling for justice, righteousness, and peace for life. Because food is life. Gifts to one great hour of sharing are helping the people of the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota through a partnership with Owe Aku, a grassroots nonprofit organization that puts people in charge of their own food supply, nutrition, health, and well being by reclaiming ancestral wisdom and teaching Lakota history and culture. The Pine Ridge Reservation is a food desert located in a county that has the lowest per capita income in the nation. The pandemic has dramatically amplified the desperate need for food security. Because water is life, gifts to one great hour of sharing are helping the families of Capirandita in a remote area of Bolivia face a more hopeful future by building infrastructure to address the community's critical water shortage. Their goal is to create 500 meters of pipes to transport safe well water to those in need. One great hour of sharing gifts will also support the distribution of plastic containers to collect and save rainwater. Because survivors are key to shaping lives focused on justice for all, gifts to one great hour of sharing 
are helping Black Women's Blueprint in its mission to take action on social justice issues and to deliver educational resources and support services to women, including those who have suffered sexual and other forms of abuse. Their work seeks to address the unique struggles of black women and girls within the context of the larger racial justice concerns. They're not just addressing issues of trauma, but they're also providing things like food and housing assistance that people need in order to be whole. The special offerings of PCUSA, including One Great Hour of Sharing, offer the whole church a way to embody Matthew 25 through the spirit-inspired stories and gifts that place us in service and partnership with those who have least. Our gifts directly support people experiencing hunger, homelessness, thirst, imprisonment, sickness, and deprivation, as well as welcoming the stranger. Our One Great Hour of Sharing is the largest way the Presbyterians come together in mission and ministry with those whom we see are in need. Because we are the church together, we can give to one great hour of sharing because of where the church belongs, of who the church is. Please give generously so that our church will continue to become, as Isaiah said, repairers of the breach. And as we always say, when we all do a little, it adds up to a lot. Let us pray. God of life be with us. May we see you in the lives of all we meet and may we offer ourselves in kindness and kinship to all those in need, amen. So if anybody wants to uh, read a little bit more about any of these three stories that you heard about, uh, the links to their stories are on um, the chat. So you can click on those and read a little bit more about each one of those communities. And we are, uh, we are thankful for the opportunity to give in this way. And to all of you who have muted your cameras, you can unmute your cameras now as we say, thank you to the children for being a part of that message about uh, One Great Hour of Sharing. Remember, we're dedicating the fish banks and your offerings. So you can write a check as well to support the offerings of One Great Hour of Sharing on April 18th. So in the weeks leading up to Easter this year, we have been exploring different Bible characters and their journeys of life. And in each one of their stories, there are paths and choices that stretch out before them. We are calling them pilgrimages. Mark Nepo says to journey and to be transformed by the journey is to be a pilgrim. So our invitation is to reflect on those times when we too have been cast out like Adam and Eve, or left home, like Abram and Sarai, when we've been moving through a transition, like Moses and the people of Israel as they crossed the Red Sea, to consider when we found ourselves changing plans and heading in a different direction, like the Holy Family's night flight to Egypt, or choosing to venture into a strange and foreign land or conversation, or relationship like Jesus and the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman, to open ourselves to opportunities for transformation in and through the journeys of our lives, to experiencing God and others, our neighbors, and ourselves in new ways, new life-giving ways. So today's theme is starting over. What comes to your mind, your heart, when you hear starting over? Opportunity, dread, learning something new, leaving something behind, trying again, facing responsibility or consequences, failure, growth, embarrassment, grief. Does starting over sound exciting, exhausting, frightening, long overdue? 
What are the stakes? What's involved? What's the cost? And what's the upside? Resources, resilience, relationships. What does it take to start over? Even the way that question's asked sounds like it's going to claim something from us. What does it take? Energy, money, time, pride. What if we asked, what will starting over offer? A chance, a choice to grow, to change. He's lost everything. He's hungry, he's far from home, he's broke, and yet it's there that life awaits. Last week for the worship service, I offered a prayer by Jan Richardson on the blessing of the dry bones. This is when the Lord took the prophet Ezekiel to that valley of dry bones, and she, she wrote, do you think this is where you had come to die? I tell you, this is where you will receive your life again. Barbara Brown Taylor calls this the spiritual fruit of failure. When we fall ill, lose our jobs, wreck our marriages, alienate our children, or alienate our parents, it's hard to shake the shame of getting lost in our lives. And yet, she says, if someone were to ask us to pinpoint the times in our lives that changed us for the better, would we say it is those times? When the safety net has split, Taylor says, when the resources are gone, when the way ahead is not clear, the sudden exposure can be both frightening and revealing. Most of us work very hard to protect ourselves against this kind of exposure, and maybe even harder to protect those we love from this. And yet, and yet, you told yourself you would die if it ever came to this, Barbara Brown Taylor writes, and but here you are. You cannot help yourself, and yet you live. What do you make of this? What will you make of this? My father is a fiercely independent and self-reliant man. He had hardly been sick a day in his life when a few years ago he found himself in emergency with a twisted bowel. He drove himself to the hospital in the middle of the night, checked himself in, had a procedure, checked himself out and drove home, and my mother had not even been awake yet. He didn't tell his children for several days. He'd taken care of it, or so he thought. The treatment didn't last. He needed surgery. Late in his 80s, my father had a section of his colon removed. And the weeks that he spent in the rehab facility, away from my mom, vulnerable, were among his hardest. And they wouldn't let him bathe himself. They wouldn't let him go to the bathroom by himself. Here you are. <laughs> you cannot help yourself. And yet, you live. When my father was well enough to go home, he was so thankful. He was thankful for the care he received, and he was thankful, he told us, for the lessons he learned. He learned to let down his guard and to let people help him. He learned to trust the nurses and to see their compassionate hearts. And he used that experience to help my mom become more comfortable with letting people help her, which was also not her strong suit. My father's body failure taught him a spirit of patience, of gentleness, of kindness, of gratitude. 
Listen again to the opening words I read earlier. When I have become so reliant on myself that I cannot see the need that gnaws so deep in my soul, open my eyes, open my heart, open my mouth to cry out for the help you do not ration, the deliverance you delight to offer in glad and generous measure. How many times do you suppose the younger brother said to himself, I could never go back there. I could never show my face to my father, my mother, my brother, the village. I would rather die than go back there. What does he imagine he'll find there? But resentment, anger, judgment, a village of people ready to condemn him for his foolishness, a lifetime of lectures he's already given to himself a hundred times. So what makes him willing to go back? What moves him from, I could never, to, what if I went and presented myself as a hired hand. Sometimes it's the last option. Desperation can be quite the motivator. If it's go back or literally die of starvation, I'll go back to survive. But he does not go as a son. Of that, he is very clear-headed. He already spent the last dime of that privilege. He goes as a hired hand. He goes as a day laborer. Day laborers in that culture had no connection to the family or the household. They were hired on a per diem basis. And sometimes they went several days without being chosen, hired. That is who he is now when he goes back. He goes looking for work from a man who he has seen treat his hired labor well by going back to start over he creates an opportunity for everybody else to start over too so what will his father do and what will the villagers do and what will the older brother do what would you do there are paths and there are choices that stretch out before each of these characters. There are paths that are culturally expected. They are socially defensible and they are religiously prescribed. They are, there are choices too that maintain self-image that nobody would blame you for choosing, that keep the order. There are safe choices. And then there are other paths. There are paths that are unexpected, that are restorative that are head turning, that are jaw dropping paths. There are choices rife with possibility, risky, and yet carrying such great upside potential of restoring and healing community. There are literally life saving choices. His father makes the first move. And he does this in a very public, and undignifying way. He gathers up his robes, he exposes his legs, and he runs, runs to his son, and heads turn. Older Middle Eastern men rarely run because they wear such long robes. They run only in the case of emergency. And here's what's so urgent. Before his son will see another face, before a single villager gets a chance to say a hostile word, the father is determined to get to him first with love. And this is a public signal to the village How you decide to treat my son is how you're treating me. This father clothes him with compassion, with protection, and with restored family honor. And then having restored the family honor, how to restore the village honor? 
throw a party and invite everybody. And this is the father risking everything because there's a very real possibility that no one will come. That's how offensive his son's behavior has been to them all. Mothers of this village do not want their children growing up like this young man. And fathers of the village, they don't condone that he asked for the money up front, that his father gave it to him, that he wasted it, and that there's not a harsher consequence. Everybody has an opinion. It's uncomfortable. It's awkward. But how do they refuse the invitation when he puts it like that, when he says, this son of mine was dead? And now he's alive. Come celebrate with us. He was lost. And now he's found. How can they not celebrate that? If they refuse, if they don't come, it is over for this family. But if they come, if they come, reconciliation is possible. This whole village can start over anew. Which path will they choose? At the end of the day, the elder son holds the cards. He's already received his inheritance, remember? All that's left is his. So when his father says to him, all that is mine is yours, it's true. It's already been divvied up. All that was his father's is now his. He owns everything. What will he do? His response matters a lot. Surely we had to celebrate. This is your brother. And he was dead. And now he's alive. He was lost. And now he's found. The elder son's rejection sends a signal to the village, too. A powerful signal. That order will now be restored, that his father was foolish, and that this kind of thing will not happen again now that he is in charge. This just might be a message that village would prefer to hear. Jesus tells this story to a mixed crowd of younger and older brothers. Those the village labels as tax collectors and sinners, they're judged as untrustworthy or unsavory. They don't want their kids growing up to be like those people. And also in the crowd are the reputable, responsible, orderly ones, the ones convinced that they are God's favored sons. Some people in the crowd lean in and listen intently as Jesus tells this story. They're hopeful and they feel, they feel the warmth of the Father's love and they yearn for it to be for them. They sense the honesty and the purity of it. They yearn for it to be for all people but they know how their world works in the hands of the elder brothers. They want this story to end differently. They want for this story to end differently. And they suspect that it never will. And others listening keep their arms crossed, their hearts closed, shaking their heads. They walk away with an even greater conviction that they will do their part to keep the world working as it is. And Jesus, Jesus knows the truth that the world is made whole by the power of transforming love 
that the invitation is held out for all to start over and over and over again, that this story can end differently and that each story can end differently, that he will risk it all and it will be worth the risk. The kingdom of God is here. The celebration awaits. And how can we not celebrate? The dead are alive again, the lost are found, and there is room for everyone. The offer is to start over. And this time, to open your heart a little more, to open your mind a little more, to open your circle a little more, to welcome to reconcile, to learn, to give, and to receive God's lavish grace. I've been thinking since I've been working on this sermon about the church's role in helping support people who are starting over. Not just people in our church family, not just people in our community, but people around the world, communities of people who are starting over. It's what we do in the ministry in the name of Jesus Christ. And there are different ways to do this. There are different ways that through your generosity, through your gifts, we are able to do this ministry. This is just a list of some of the different ways to give. We we receive pledges and gifts for our general, our general operating budget. I want to talk a little bit this morning about the legacy fund, but there, it's a part of our restricted funds. And that is to say that these are funds that have been set up that cannot be used for salaries. They cannot be used for operating expenses, but they are used for a particular purpose. The music fund is used, for example, to support music ministry of the church, buying new music, tending to the musical instruments supporting music licenses and supporting um, uh, guest instrumentalists for concerts. The Heritage Fund we might consider as a capital obsolescence fund. It's been primarily used for the roof and for other things that go on with our building that need uh, additional funds, insulation, so forth. We've talked about our denominational offerings, our one great hour of sharing. It's an international reach to help people and communities starting over. Every month, there's a different way to donate through our deacons to our community. And those are usually in material uh, things. They're usually not in money, but in, in things that are being asked for by our partners in ministry. And of course, giving of time and talent, sharing of the gifts that God has given to you in support of the church and support of the community. But just for a moment, I want to say something about this legacy fund that was uh, introduced to celebrate 150 years of ministry in this location. This building is a little now over 150 years old, and we set up this fund at that time. And there are these pictures on the wall, the 150 on the wall on our way up to the sanctuary that have pictures of people who were part of the life of this church throughout those years. Uh, this is a, a fund that honors the past by seeding the future. And so we, we give to it in honor of people that have made a difference in our lives. Uh, and we, uh, and session then approves using these funds for purposes that seed the faith for the future, for future generations. So I just want to highlight a couple things for the last year and this year that have been drawn from the legacy fund. We have been purchasing education curriculum as we are starting and launching, starting over this children's ministry at this church. And this year on Easter Sunday, we are dedicating 33 Bibles that are being given to children of this church at the age appropriate learning level. So ex excited to say that. And that was um, supported by the Legacy Fund and is in honor of, dedicated to uh, Jeanette Gillis, who um, died recently at 106 years old, a Sunday school teacher of this church and also uh, a teacher in the community. So we are, we are honoring her by planting, sowing seeds of faith with our children. Last year also, there was a generous gift for the development of hunger ministry. This would be something that's not just, it's not part of a food pantry, but is really addressing a family that has need at this time in particular, uh, when so many are in need from the pandemic. So that exists as a way to, uh, to support someone in need, particularly uh, for hunger ministry. 
And then finally, on this list, the families of the immigration process. You may or may not know that this church has a history of supporting resettlement of uh, immigration uh, refugees coming into this country several years ago, so resettled two families. So honoring that past and, and considering the need for the, the current and future, uh, this is a, a dedication um, of some legacy fund dollars toward families in the immigration process. So these are just a few ways that this fund is working to help people who are starting over uh, in and through this land of ours. I thank you again for your generosity. As we turn now to our final hymn, the first hymn was written by David Gambrell, who's a Presbyterian minister, as is this one. This one, There Is Now a New Creation, David Gambrell wrote at the same time. He wrote the other one, same year. And this one is about the story that we have lifted up this morning from Luke chapter 15. There is now a new creation through the grace of Jesus Christ. Peace and reconciliation with the God of endless life. Call the lost and found together. Tell the news to everyone. Now the past is gone. charge this morning again is from Joyce Rupp, our prayer for openness that we have been ending our worship service with throughout these weeks leading up to Easter. I invite you to join me. Open my mind to remember your presence. Open my mouth to speak your wisdom. Open my heart to extend your love. Open my hands to serve you generously. Open my whole being to you, we pray. Today's postlude was written by Will Thompson, born in Liverpool, Ohio in 1847. The song speaks of a deeply personal and intimate relationship with Jesus, with simple and childlike language. Jesus is all the world to me, my life, my joy, my all. He is my strength from day to day. Without him, I would fall. When I'm sad, to him I go. No other one can cheer me so. When I'm sad, he makes me glad. He is my friend.
Thank you, Francisco. And at this time, we invite you to check in with each other in smaller fellowship groups. So if you see an invitation arise on your screen before you, and you'd like to check in with each other, say yes, and we'll be back in about 10 minutes. Find your Christ candle if you haven't yet extinguished it, and we will blow it out together and wish each other a beautiful day, warmed by the light God is providing for us today in the spring day. Peace of Christ be with you, everybody. Peace also with you. Also with you. Also with you, everyone.